Well, I like real estate just because uh, I, I like the benefit of being able to uh, have a mortgage pay off real estate over time so that when I retire, I have something. I like the fact that it's boring. I want to be able to be uh, entertained and travel and do a lot of things in my retirement. And that boring investment of real estate allows me to do that. Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show with Jason Hartman. You're about to learn a new slant on investing, some exciting techniques and fresh new approaches to the world's most historically proven asset class that will enable you to create more wealth and freedom than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine self-made multimillionaire who's actually been there and done it. He's a successful investor, lender, developer, and entrepreneur who's owned properties in 11 states, had hundreds of tenants and been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to your financial independence day. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to episode 1372-1372, and I am coming to you from the high seas, Yes, we just left Nassau and Half Moon K. I don't know if you can hear this or not. My microphone's pretty good, but I'm out on the deck of the cruise ship, and it is windy. And we are steaming through waves, and you can probably hear the ocean back there, but I'm going to go inside. I'm looking out at a, a sky with stars. Got the room lights on, so not seeing enough stars because my eyes haven't adjusted anyway. Heading back inside now, just had to give you a taste of what it's like after leaving Florida, leaving the Port of Fort Lauderdale, Port Everglades. It's just absolutely stunning with this beautiful, warm air, and it's so fresh and nice and ah, really good. Anyway, I'm on a cruise here this week with a bunch of entrepreneurs. We're headed toward Grand Turk. Going to add a few countries to my country list. I'm at 84 so far. Tomorrow, that will be my 85th country, and then I'll hit 86 after this, so uh, that's exciting. A lot of times traveling to these places, going over and over to the same place, I don't add to the country count. There is a website for the Centurion Club where you visited 100 countries or more, so got to get in there and <laughs> get, the, get in the Century Club for country visits. Anyway, hey, today we've got a great show. Our uh, friend Pat Donahoe, who's been on the show before, is with me, and we just discuss a whole bunch of things. It's kind of a download on the economy, housing, the future, a lot of futurist topics. And hey, as Yogi Berra said, the future ain't what it used to be. No, it certainly isn't. It's an amazing time to be alive. It really is. Uh, as far as uh, technology goes, you know that I am bullish on technology and the future, but I am bearish on culture and the culture war. We'll see how it all pans out. It's always a pendulum. Everything goes back and forth. The pendulum goes back and forth. It sways from uh, one direction to the other over time. This will be no exception, so it's, it'll be interesting to see what the future holds. And we'll talk about that a little bit today on today's episode. But I got to tell you something. I just read an article about how the global debt-to-GDP ratio is at an all-time record high. And what was my first thought when reading that article? Hopefully it was the same thought you had, because uh, the thought should always be, is that in real dollars? Well, it's measured in U.S. dollars, sure, but every country's currency needs to be converted, whatever, you get the idea, right? The global GDP, how much is that? Somewhere in the neighborhood of $80 trillion. So in other words, Every year, it's like your income. Look at it as though it's your household income. If your household income is, just for round numbers, $100,000 per year, then that is your household GDP, right? That's your GDP. That's your gross domestic product, essentially. And if your debt is $300,000, then your debt-to-GDP ratio is what? It's three to one, right? You've got three times the amount of debt to what you earn every year. And if you had that much debt, would you think that's good or bad? Would you have too much debt? That's a good question. 
It depends what type of debt it is. If it's mortgage debt, and I'm not even talking about mortgage debt on income properties, which is the best type of debt, because income property is the most debt-favored asset class. It gives you that wonderful, beautiful, self-liquidating debt. It gives you inflation-induced debt destruction. It gives you leverage. It is beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. It's a wonderful type of debt. But even if it wasn't that wonderful type of debt, say it's just a mortgage on a home, a home in which you live. You earn $100,000 a year, and you have a mortgage of $300,000. Is that bad? Well, I would say no. It's not that out of whack. Well, the global debt-to-GDP ratio at its all-time high is now 322%. There's a lot of talk about debt and how the world is too in debt, the country is too in debt, every country is too in debt, not just sort of referring to the U.S., but in the developed world, nobody has more extreme debt-to-GDP ratio than Japan. Okay, now I'm sure many smaller countries do, but but for, for a big economy, Japan is really, really lopsided, right? Of course, we're in uncharted territory with this debt issue. But when you compare it to the debt of a person, of an individual, or a household, I'm not sure it's really that bad. But oddly, I want it to be that bad. And now you new listeners are saying, this guy's nuts. I got to turn him off or I got to listen to him just because I'm curious as to how nuts he is. Well, (laughs) no, I'm not nuts. Why do I want it to be bad? If it's bad, that means an inflationary future. And what does that mean for us as income property investors? An inflationary future is a wonderful thing. We love inflation, right? It's great. It's philosophically bad. It's bad for most people, but it's good for us because we have done not necessarily the right thing. I'll put right in air quotes as I say the right thing. We've done the smart thing. We've done the prudent thing. We've aligned our interests with the most powerful forces the human race has ever known after God. Okay, God is the most powerful force the human race has ever known. And now I hear the atheist crying, well, I don't believe in God. Okay, whatever. Uh, Do you believe in natural disasters? Do you believe in Mother Nature? Do you believe in Father Time? Okay, well, fine. Then substitute that for God. Okay. (laughs) Right. Fine, fine, fine. Whatever. You get the idea. These big, powerful things, right? After those powerful things, the two most powerful forces after that, two most powerful human-made forces are governments and central banks. And we align our interest with those most powerful man-made forces, governments and central banks. And look, they're irresponsible. They spend money like drunken sailors. I love what Ronald Reagan said. He said, to say that the government spends money like drunken sailors is an insult to drunken sailors. (laughs) Because the drunken sailors aren't as bad as the government. But you know, when you really look at the numbers and you compare it with a household or an individual, I'm not I'm not so sure the debt problem, whether it be at the national level, the global level, I'm not really sure it's that extremely bad. I don't know. Maybe it is. Of course, sovereign debt is different than individual debt and household debt. Yes, that's true. And governments need to spend and invest in a more prudent way than maybe individuals do. But this is something, honestly, I struggle with, and I struggle with how to articulate it to you, our listeners. So I would love to get your feedback on this. I really would, because 
honestly, I'm not so sure that the debt problem is as bad as everybody makes it out to be. Of course, there's the gold bugs and the doom and gloomers and the cryptocurrency nuts and all this stuff out there saying, oh, buy gold, buy Bitcoin because it's all going to crash. The sky is falling. Okay, Howard Ruff, who's been on the show, Peter Schiff, who's been on the show, Jim Rogers, who's been on the show three times. And Jim Rogers, I really don't mean to even put him in the same class as those other two guys, <laughs> you know. Uh, but but all these chicken little, the sky is falling people, right? Which, listen, I, I'm not saying they're dumb. They're very smart people. You can sell a lot more books and get a lot more attention by talking about the collapse, the up and coming collapse, Right. You know, is the collapse ever going to happen? I don't know. They've been saying this for literally centuries, starting with Malthus. Okay, the Malthusian idea was what? 200 years ago or something like that, right? The, the idea that resources are scarce and we're going to run out of resources and there's overpopulation. Forgive me if I forget the era in which Malthus lived, I don't know, it was at least 100 years ago. It was more than 100 years ago, right? Maybe it was 200, I don't know, I can't remember. But the point is, people have been preaching the sky is falling pretty much forever. And if you look at all these religious sects and religious cults, they've been preaching it for a long time too. And no, I'm not just talking about the Branch Davidians or the people with the, the purple jumpsuits and the Nike shoes, right? Uh, I'm not talking about just that or Jim Jones and the Guyana Massacre or any of that stuff. I'm talking hundreds of years ago that this stuff was going on. Just, you know, look at history. I don't know. What do you think about the debt to GDP ratio? At the level of your country, I mean, we've got listeners in 189 countries. So what do you think about it at the level of your country? What do you think about it at the United States level, the largest economy in the world? And what do you think about it at a global level? The debt to GDP ratio is the highest ever, 322% debt to GDP ratio. Is that really as bad as it sounds? Go to jasonhartman.com slash ask and give us your thoughts jasonhartman.com slash ask, A-S-K, and tell us what you think. We'd love to hear from you. Ask a question, make a comment, express your opinion. We'd love to hear from you. jasonhartman.com slash ask. Without further ado, let's get to our guest today, as Pat and I will talk about how it is an amazing time to be alive. It's great pleasure to have Patrick Donahoe back on the show. He is the author of the fantastic book, Heads I Win, Tales You Lose, A Financial Strategy to Reignite the American Dream. And of course, he is founder and CEO of Paradigm Life. And he is a thinker, an intellectual, a financial genius, and a great entrepreneur. Pat, it's great to have you back on the show. Welcome back. Hey, Jason. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Good to have you for sure. So uh, this time of year, as we were talking, we had, uh, you know, we don't live near each other. You're in Salt Lake City. I'm in Palm Beach, Florida. So we had an hour and 20 minute video meeting uh, recently. And that was really nice to really do that sort of formally, almost like we're getting together and, you know, sitting across the dinner table or something. And we just talked about a whole variety of issues. Of course, this time of year, everybody's thinking about, well, reflecting on the past decade, reflecting on the past year, and then looking forward to this year and this new decade we're in. Many have talked about the fourth turning lately, you know, that book uh, that was written a while back. I never got my head around that one too much. But, uh, you know, what do you think? What are your thoughts about where we've been and where we're going? Well, Jason, I don't know if you remember our first conversation in Dallas. It was at a syndication event. And and we had spoken before. We had never met each other face to face, but we had dinner and it was part of this event. But we talked Mm -hmm. for a couple hours on a lot of the same topics as the other day we were on the phone. And listen, my perspective hasn't really changed much. And that's where I think we hit it off because you know, you, you go into Zero Hedge or, or Drudge or look at the traditional media and it's like, the you know, the world's falling apart. The sky and is falling. <laughs> it, yeah. And I think there's definitely truths to that. Yeah. But if you look at in the past or throughout history, there's always been indications of, you know, turmoil, whether it's financial, social uh, or otherwise. And 
I think that perspective is always going to, to be there. I think we're humans, you know, we are erratic, we're irrational. And if you want to look for turmoil and chaos and crisis, you're always going to find it. But mm-hmm. at the same time, I love thinkers that are optimistic about uh, about the future. I mean, 2019 was, it concluded a decade, you know, it bridged into the 2020s. And, you know, there's a lot of really interesting things uh, going on. And I'm always trying to find the optimism that is there and it's in spades. And so, I don't know, our conversation then, you know, went into, you know, the impact that AI is going to have on the world, the impact that globalization is going to have in a positive light. And despite some of the chaos that's going on, I'm really excited about what the 2020s are going to uh, are, are going to bring. You know, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, as I always say, it's an amazing time to be alive. And I mean that mostly about kind of the world in general. I'm pretty negative on the culture. I think that the culture has decayed a lot. I just experienced that. I met with Mitch Russo and we had kind of an early dinner just now. He's the author of a couple of books, which I know you're a fan of Mitch's uh, work. Definitely. And, uh, I was saying that to him and, you know, it's sort of a reflection to some extent of how easy it is to get by, which is a sign that life is pretty good. Now, that's not necessarily good for human motivation, right? Because when it's easy, we sort of get soft and it's the lull to uh, apathy a little bit, right? But there are so many revolutions that we are really on the brink of. And I don't know that that's ever been this significant in history. In fact, I'm almost sure it is never, you know, like I always say, you know, when the steam engine came out, they thought that was the biggest thing ever, right? And so we we always tend to think that with whatever technology is available at the time. But right now, as you mentioned, we've got artificial intelligence. We've got the sharing economy. We've got this, the global mind of billions and billions of people is finally being meshed together where we're seeing the massive, incredible sharing of ideas. You know, when you spoke at one of our events, you talked about one of the things that really led the Enlightenment hundreds of years ago, and that was coffee shops, right? Where where people (laughs) could get together and share ideas and coffee shops were a big deal in the building of civilization. Now yeah. we have social media, okay? And uh, I, I can't believe how much I learn every day just by looking at my social media feeds from my brilliant friends and reading the articles. They're like my clipping service. They clip the articles for me and tell me what to pay attention to. It's really incredible. Biotech, nanotechnology, you know, commercialization of space, quantum computing, DNA storage for memory, and then also for batteries. I mean, there, there are just so many incredible things that we're on the verge of. I just can't imagine that it's not going to lead to a massive amount of lifestyle improvement. It's going to, but you hit on something, Jason, that I find really interesting. And it's one of those things where you can't necessarily predict what's going to happen, but you have these forces of, of human nature that compel us to do things. And there's a force that compels us to not work. But then there's a force that compels us to work. And I think the differentiator is survival, is having to do it in a lot of cases. But ultimately, we don't have to do much in the United States to survive anymore. And I believe that technology is making it so things are going to get cheaper. You're going to have way more options. And the options you will have will allow you to live a lifestyle that would be the envy of kings of hundreds of years ago, oh, of course. Uh, maybe even a hundred years ago. Oh, even a hundred this... years ago. You know, one yeah. of the Venture Alliance trips, and I, I don't know if you were on that trip. Forgive me. I can't remember. We went to Newport, Rhode Island, and we saw the mansions. Were you there on that trip? No, I wasn't no, there. I was, that was a year before I, I started going with you. Yep. It was before you joined. Okay. And um, That's where I grew up, so I know that place. I know that place really well. Oh, Oh, you were a rich kid, huh? Wow. <laughs> no, I, I grew up in Connecticut, but my parents live in in uh, on Cape Cod. Ah. So we would drive through Rhode Island. That's one of the routes you can take. And so I'm familiar with the area. Yeah, fantastic. Really familiar with it. And one of our Venture Alliance Mastermind members just pointed out, he said, you look at these people who were the industrialists who basically owned the world, you know, the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, the Mellons, the Vanderbilts, right? All of these... And and they're amazing mansions. But today we have 
far more conveniences than they did. And if you're poor in America, the conveniences you have are better than the conveniences they had in many ways, not in all ways, of course. But technology just really opens the world to people. It makes it very accessible. And I know you follow Peter Diamandis like I do, and, and you know he talks about that quite a bit. And the point I was making with that is you're going to have a point in time where the motivation of individuals uh, as an aggregate if it doesn't change to purpose driven mission driven you know a mission driven lifestyle instead of survival then it's going to be a rough road for people right because the purpose has, has changed as far as work is concerned that was a big theme in the book that i wrote is you know people didn't come to the us you know or come to this new world uh, you know we're celebrating the 400th year of of the pilgrims landing in in plymouth they didn't come here to retire right they didn't come here to seek just where things would be provided for them, where they wouldn't have to work. The intention was fascinating, right? They came here to be free. And I, I believe that that is really what the American dream is, is, is freedom. But it's not freedom from having to do something, right? It's freedom to do something. And it's freedom to do something that I, w- I think is meaningful. And I believe that when that becomes the motivation of people, then life takes on new meaning. It takes on new tasks, new drive, new motivation, and, and I believe that the retirement generation right now, which you're seeing, right, their lifestyle is actually going down. Uh, if you analyze, you know, their, the data associated with their health, because there's no longer purpose, right? The purpose is, you know, playing golf or tennis or pickleball now, and it's not driven to benefit other people. And so I, I look at, you know, just the notion of financial services and the purpose it plays. And I believe there's going to be lots of revolution there with this bridging of the gap. I think that, you know, millennials, or I'll say the younger generation, right? Their motivations are more lifestyle driven and purpose driven and mission driven, if you really boil some of it down. And I believe that as money is changed from the baby boomer generation, as it, you know, transfers to this younger generation, you're going to see allocation, you know, into a lot of different areas and sectors that are going to make others obsolete. Uh, But I think it's a really interesting time in history where over the next even five years, there's just going to be massive change. It's like it's all come to this precipice and it's compounded. And now we're going to start to see the reality of all, so much work and so much momentum that has been building up over the last couple of decades. It's an order of magnitude. It's the hockey stick on the graph, right? If you look at a graph and you see that hockey stick when things just go up exponentially, That's where we probably are. Of course, the things I did not mention a moment ago, I did not mention 3D printing, blockchain and cryptocurrencies. And as you all know, I'm not a big cryptocurrency fan, but uh, there will be cryptocurrency. I just think the ones that will win will be sponsored by governments and central banks. 100%. I I believe the same thing. And in many ways, they're going to use that to control the populations, of course, and we're not going to have the kind of financial privacy we had before. However, no and that, nope. and that that's bad, right? I don't like that. However, there will be some real benefits because money and the ability to use it, the convenience of using it and the innovations in it, there is real technology behind it. And that's going to make our lives better in many ways. You look at what's going on in China. Stansberry just came out with a documentary that's it didn't get very good ratings. But anyway, um, you know, I watched it and it was all about uh, China and and they told you a lot of stuff, but they kind of didn't tell you a lot of stuff. Also, it's hosted by Steve Sugarrood and he's been on the show before and, and he's a really, really bright guy, really interesting guy. And you, you just look at the kind of innovation that they're having with their currency. Almost nobody uses cash there. And there is some real benefit to that, of course. Autonomous everything, not just cars, but airplanes, shuttle helicopters that are ride-sharing vehicles you can just summon, space travel, material science. There are all of these revolutions. Uh, They talk about the rising billion, but it's really the rising three billion. I mean, if you think society has benefited from sharing knowledge and collaboration so far, you're absolutely right. It's been incredible. The ability to have people map the human genome and gamify that 
on the internet where people are doing it for fun. Uh, when people are uh, using those Kapschka things, when we, you know, sign into a computer or sign into a website and it verifies you're not a robot, many times those are for a huge purpose. You're actually reading address numbers and helping map the world. In, or, index the world, yeah. Yeah, or, or you're helping read books. Uh, you know, there's there's all kinds of amazing things we don't even know. And so now we see three billion more people that aren't online yet, or at least not in any significant way. No. And they have all sorts of knowledge to share and benefit from. And that just grows the economy. It just grows the economy. Well, Jason, you also look at they're not just doing it. And I'm still speaking on, about China it has gone outside of the borders, right? They, they're they the biggest investor in Africa. And Africa you know, has some of the highest growth of millionaires and billionaires uh, based on being able to provide some infrastructure, financial support, direction, uh, technology, which is, you know, Africa is just this up and coming population that's, that's massive. You know, I heard a statistic a couple of years ago that there are more people uh, in Africa under the age of 30 than the entire population of the United States. And so you you look at, again, there, there's so much equity or or capacity uh, within other countries, emerging markets, when it comes to them desiring the lifestyle that Americans have spearheaded. And and I believe that, you know, it, it's going to happen rapidly when there's connection that takes place. Now you're going to have this very integrated, uh, connected world economy and, you know, language and the ability to have translation at speeds that are just unfathomable. It's going to be really exciting. And there's going to be lots of opportunity. There's going to be disruption too. I mean, with all the things that you had just mentioned, okay, things become obsolete, financial systems become obsolete. And you're starting to see signs of that already with the U.S. financial system and how that's, you know, impacted other parts of the world, then they're going to get sick of it and developing their own type of uh, structure. But I don't know, it, it's exciting because you're all, with disruption, there's always going to be something that that's negative that comes out of it. At the same time- There will always be winners and losers. I believe yeah. there's always gonna be an outweighing of that based on what is positive that comes out of it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And just a little aside to something you just mentioned, you, you basically talked about how language is becoming transparent. And that actually already exists. You know, you can buy basically- AirPods, if you will, that go in your ear. They're wireless. One goes in your ear, the other goes in the ear of the other speaker, and it will translate your languages on the fly. Yep. That is, and now I'm sure it doesn't work great yet. Okay. Otherwise, everybody would no, be. That, using yeah, that it. was my point. A lot of it exists. Yeah. It just, it just right. needs to be improved. Yeah. Yeah. And, but it will improve massively. And with AI and quantum computing, knocking on the door, of course, that's going to happen. It's right around the corner. And so I would say that, look, it's always impressive. You know, my girlfriend, for example, speaks four languages, okay? And, and of course, you know, Carmen, that's always impressive. But one thing people forget to ask is about how you can't hear the dogs that don't bark, right? You know, in other words, if you didn't spend the time learning languages, you could have spent the time learning something else, right? Yep. And, you know, she did that when she was much younger, so you couldn't have then, right? It wouldn't have mattered then. It seemed like language was definitely the thing you want to learn. But now, like today, I would argue that learning a language may not be, besides your own, may not be as valuable as you think it is going forward, because that's going to become transparent through technology at some Absolutely. point in the not too distant future. I totally agree. Yeah. So, so, you know, maybe you could learn a whole new science or physics or engineering or programming or something else instead, because the language will become more and more transparent as, as time goes on for sure. Well, Jason, so I, this, is, this is interesting. So I, I heard a the, the slogan, I think it's the Ritz-Carlton slogan. Have you ever come across that before? I do not know what the Ritz-Carlton slogan yeah. is. I stayed at a Ritz-Carlton recently, but uh, yeah. so I don't know what Here's slogan. the slogan, and I think it is perfectly... Oh, in, in I know the, what it the, is. I know what you're going to say. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. It's, it's systemize the predictable so you can humanize the exceptional. 
Ah, that's not the slogan I was thinking of. I had another one for you. That's that's good. So what I will read your read yours. Say, and I'll, say, and I'll talk say about it again. The say it again. Yeah, say it again. Systemize system, systemize the predictable so that you can humanize the exceptional. Ah, that's really good. So in other words, it lightens the burden on the humans to be available to make for other exceptional things because the underlying stuff is all systematized, right? Exactly. Yeah. And the point is, I think that's, this is within that slogan is where all the opportunity is. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the human ex experience and, and understanding what humans really want, there are some things that, you know, humans do right now, driving trucks, you have working in restaurants, fast food restaurants, you, you have positions, right. And jobs and work that can be easily uh, systematized. And so you're going to have a lot of displacement. There's going to be obsolescence in a lot of different businesses and industries at the same time when there's focus on what, you know, human beings really want and you can position whether it's business or investment uh, or your, your profession into that exceptional, there's always going to be, I would say a demand for the human being. But as you said, language it's one of those things where it's going to be systematized. Communication is going to be systematized. So therefore, the focus should be on something that's going to be more, more human, right? It's going to be more exceptional. Because I think that's where what this slogan means is that, you know, humanizing the exceptional is the human being is associated with the exceptional. And they've delegated the rest of their time and effort and energy to what they w would normally have spent to uh, what's systematized. Does that make sense? Yeah, it uh, it absolutely makes sense. And uh, just uh, for the listeners, <laughs> the the slogan I was thinking of, which is probably one that they abandoned a while ago, because listen, I'm bearish on culture. I think our culture kind of stinks, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> and it's become so casual. And I always say to the listeners, watch old movies and watch old TV shows you know, you kind of see how far the world has fallen in many ways. I mean, people were so polite and proper. I get that it's just a movie or a TV show. I know it's not exactly real life, but it's a representation. You know, they got it from somewhere. It reflects something of the era, right? Anyway, the Ritz-Carlton saying that I remember is, uh, you know, in other words, uh, a supervisor speaking to the staff would say, we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. Right now, imagine that nowadays, right? <laughs> well, Jason, it's you know it's interesting. There is a there was an article that that really impacted me uh, a couple months ago, and it talked about the the declining life expectancies, uh, especially with those that are kind of in their their prime of life between twenty five and fifty, and it was because of you know uh, suicide, uh, prescription drug use, yeah. drug abuse, massive obesity, um, problem. obesity. Yeah, and, you know, right, yeah. If I look at all the a different advancements stuff, yeah. that we have, and and this is where I see that the trend is like people, you know, people are seeking meaning before having to survive working twelve hours and fourteen hours a day, yeah. or, um, or just to put food or on the table, hours a day. Yeah, 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 and not having as much entertainment. Like today, there's more to do than we could in a lifetime, right? In one day. Sure. And it's one of those or the information that can be consumed. So people, I, I think, are they're not driven by necessity anymore, but yet they're still living like that and trying to find meaning and in, in other things, right? Whether it's drugs uh, or whether it's uh, uh, food, they're trying to to escape the reality that you know meaning is is missing. Yeah. And I think that's where you know it's a part of the progression when it comes to having a a population, a culture that is principle and values based, because I think that it always comes back to that equilibrium. If you look at uh, look at history, and I think it's going to go. I think it's going to go there. And the indication right now is that people are they're not fulfilled. You know, life is the meaning for them is very fleeting and superficial. And, and I believe that that is that's, it's going to change as we continue to have more and more choices, more and more technology, and are not having to do. Uh, as much as we have to do right. right now. Yeah. A little bit of struggle is good for the human spirit. And I would advise people to intentionally create some struggle for themselves. Don't yes. go don't go overboard on that idea, folks. Well, but, it's the nature of know, growth, yeah, right? It's, it's the nature wanting of to growth, grow right? and be better and do more and mm -hmm. contribute more. I think if that becomes the driving force, there's going to be an, an infinite amount of possibility to you know, to, to make a difference. And that right there gives, you know, a sense of fulfillment that, you know, keeps people going yeah. for a really long time. 
Muscles grow by resistance. Gems are polished by friction. Steel is hardened by fire. Absolutely. Some struggle is good for all of us. It definitely is. Uh, And, you know, to the parents out there, don't spoil your kids. You'll ruin them. Okay. (laughs) Give them the same (laughs) gift you got. A little bit of struggle, which made you the person you are. Okay. Uh, And like you said, Jason, it's controlled and intentional struggle. It's, you know, instead of it happening to you. Yeah. This escapism, it's not necessarily exactly escapism. Uh, There's that, but there's also just sort of this filling a void kind of issue going on in the culture. And it's always existed for sure. This is not a new idea. Okay. But it does seem like it's more of an issue as life gets in many ways easier and easier. And there's a name for it, actually. The concept of where we all sort of have this inkling feeling that gnaws at us that we're not doing as much as we could or should be doing, right? That it's being a little too apathetic. It's too easy to get by. It's called panophobia, okay? And you can't escape panophobia, okay? (laughs) You know, so the only way to solve that panophobia problem is to jump in and take life on with gusto and uh, get engaged in some causes, uh, create your own challenges and create your own meaning. Amen to that, Jason. I think you have a future as a preacher, pastor, Pastor (laughs) Jason Hartman. There you go. Absolutely. (laughs) Sounds good to me. Hey, um, uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about the economy, Pat, and I really would like to have you back to talk about interest rates, commodities prices, the housing market, the financial markets, etc. So let's do that real soon. Uh, But thanks for joining us today. Give out your website or any information you want. Of course, the book is available in all the usual places. Yeah, on the book's website is where you can it's kind of the connecting piece to everything else that I'm uh, involved with. So it's uh, headsortailsiwin.com. Heads or tails, I win.com, right? Right. Okay. That's it. Fantastic. Patrick, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jason. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, HartmanMedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.